Welcome to another episode of Faces of DiEM, the space on DiEM TV where you can meet other DiEM25 members and activists, uh, know what they are up to, what are their causes, uh, what makes them move, and uh, what being an activist in the ground entails. In this uh, episode, we uh, welcome Anna from Portugal, Nikos from Sweden, and Patricia from the Netherlands, three DiEM25 members and activists who have helped organize and support the Zapatista trip to several European countries over the last year. Hello, Anna. Do you want to introduce Hello. Us? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Nadia. Thank you so much for this invitation to share more about the work we've done uh, with this uh, adventure that has been the Zapatista Tour for Life that has unfolded over the last um, several months. My name is Anna, and I'm an independent curator of contemporary art. And I became a DM member in May uh, when I came back to Lisbon, the town where I grew up and I was looking for groups or movements that were politically active, vocal, and I had already come across DM online. So I, I looked for the active groups in Portugal. Nikos, your turn. Hi, everybody. I'm Nikos. Right now I'm, I live in Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, I joined DM25. I think almost from the beginning in 2016, after the huge disappointment that we had in Greece with, with Seas and all this stuff. <clears throat> and, um, right now I am, uh, doing like uh, different stuff in uh, Sweden. I came here to do my masters in 2018 in, uh, Latin American studies and, uh, yeah, I mean, different also have been participating in different collectives and groups, especially after the Sabatistas, but also before, and we are more in like here, the more, uh, everyday life issues are like, uh, many different social issues, but also migration uh, issues and environmental issues that also I participate. Your turn, Patricia. Hi, um, I'm Patricia. I'm from DM25 Netherlands, specifically I'm in The Hague, so I'm from the um, collective of South Holland. Um, my advocacies generally are around LGBT, feminism, women and children and migration. And in, I've been in DM for, I guess, almost two years. Um, I'm actually the coordinator for the Task Force on Feminism for DM, and it, it has been really um, great to be part of the organization to be able to reach out to other people who are like-minded across Europe so that has been a really nice um, opportunity and moment for me and experience to be able to find other people as well across Europe and not just um, in this new home that I am in in the Netherlands yes thank you so uh, we would like to know a little bit if you can tell us about the history of Zapatistas. Why is it so important uh, for us Europeans uh, to meet with them? Uh, what is in their history that we should uh, know about for people that don't know that much about it? Can you tell us a little bit about it, please, Anna? Yes. Uh, so the Zapatistas um, are an indigenous group, peasant, anti-capitalist movement uh, in the south of Mexico from Chiapas. And they started organizing themselves uh, in the 80s, in 83s. And uh, over the course of a decade, they were uh, organ politically organizing, um, uh, trying to gather as many people as possible. And in 94, uh, the 1st of January, they decided to do an armed uprising, uh, which was also a bit in response to the fact that the NAFTA was being implemented, the North American Free Trade Agreement. It was a time where Mexico was saying, um, great, we are entering the first world. And they were just um, basically leaving everyone behind or ignoring the fact that uh, these indigenous people even existed. So um there was this armed uprising. Uh, the people of Mexico asked for a cease of fire. And after that, uh, so since that time, they've been uh, creating their autonomy and, and um, building this, this autonomy that uh, encompasses their own um, governmental uh, authorities and organizing. So they have local authorities, municipalities that are called the Mares, 
and then also the juntas de buen gobierno, the good governments that are uh, 12 of them that are uh, interconnected. So, uh, and they have their own systems of, for education, for health, um, food production and distribution. So they are completely autonomous and independent from the Mexican bad government. Uh, so it's a consistent work. It's a rebellion that has been ongoing for almost three decades. And this is why it's such an inspiration. And it's an important reference anywhere in the world for any movements, because uh, they, they are an example of a stateless democracy, which is not something uh, you find so easily. And it's, it's, it comes from hard work. It comes from understanding your past, understanding that there were landlords that were just exploiting people and, and enslaving them. And they, they are a liberation movement. Do you have anything to add, Nikos, Patricia? I just wanted to quickly add that um, we also see, we also need to see and understand that the Zapatista movement is a movement that is very anti-capitalist, but also very rooted in, in race. It's uh, very rooted in racial struggles because them being mostly indigenous people, um, the racism in Mexico is very, very strong, which is why it was also even difficult for them to, to be able to leave the country and be able to do this viaje. So in understanding the struggles of the Zapatistas, we also have to root it very strongly in an in a anti-colonial and uh, race um, dialogues and um, struggles. So I think that's something we need to put into mind when we're also um, reading or hearing about them and hearing about their struggles. And also I would like to add something for the history, if I can, uh, that it's very important, like the, the date in order to come back to what, why they decided to do this trip, just to make some uh, connections. So in 1996, they made the big invitation to thousands of people all over the world to go to Chiapas and they actually created the new international because more than 3000 people went there. And uh, they started from then, from that point, actually started the big uh, and the globalization movement throughout the world during the late 90s and the beginning of uh, the new century. Like the Genova movement, uh, all these, uh, yeah, like Athamar and the Occupy movements. Uh, and after that, many years after, as they continued growing, uh, they made the next big step in uh, 2018 when they decided that they will they will send a representative like a candidate for um, uh, the from the National Indigenous Congress uh, in order to participate in the elections the general elections of Mexico in 2018, and they sent Maritzui Maria de, de Jesus uh, Patricio Martinez, um, and uh, after that, uh, which was a big thing and a big decision for the Zapatistas. Uh, they decided to do, to go to a, a next step, to do a next step, which was to go, to come all over the world, to visit all over the world. And the first stop was Europe, uh, because they, the, the time has come as they believe. And as it all, we all know that there is no time left and we need to act all together. We face the same problems that globalized problems and they came to talk and uh, they will visit all the other continents as well in order to talk and uh, inspire and share experiences and be inspired by all the people who fight for different alternatives. Thank you, Nikos. Uh, as we are discussing this, uh, who are the groups in Europe that um, uh, the Zapatistas spoke more to? And um, who, who do you think uh, they can really relate to? If we take in consideration the European contexts and the European uh, actual problems with uh, democracy, uh, techno feudalism, etc. Portugal was actually the third zone, so we were the last to be visited together with Spain. Um, but the here in Portugal, for example, uh, many of, so first the Zapatista said they want to come to Europe and they asked the organizers that uh, they want to meet with Europe 
uh, to the left and from below. So this is also what was what our task was to find the groups and movements and collectives who wanted to meet with Zapatistas and invited them. And uh, these groups were usually uh, linked to to movements that have been ongoing for a while. And here in Portugal, we we had one month. Uh, of the visit of the two groups of Zapatistas and they went from the north to the south and starting with um, the big anti-mining movement that is happening in the north because of uh, the prospects of lithium mining. Um, and, and this is a big uh, struggle because, of course, we know lithium is something um, that is very sought after now and it will be really difficult to avoid uh, this to happen in Portugal. Uh, uh, but people are, are fighting for it and it's a struggle for the lands, for the rights of not polluting, not destroying. Um, and this was a very uh, important meeting, uh, meetings, a series of meetings that happened. So also environmental struggles, in, not only in the north, but in the, in the entire country, this was a, a topic that um, followed. Another one uh, is anti-racism. Uh, here in Lisbon, especially in the cities, uh, that was that was a, a big topic as well because uh, there are many active groups. So there was even, for example, a Pan-Africanist conference that happened here in Lisbon. Um, there's also trans-feminism. There was a, a two times we had meetings with only women or trans women um, that happened, one in Coimbra, one in Lisbon. Those were closed events. Uh, and or groups, for example, Casa Te here in Lisbon that um, hosts uh, uh, transgender people and they they had a close meeting with them as well. And it was um, really interesting to see also this uh, idea of inclusiveness that that um, exists in the in the Zapatista communities because they j just don't um, they just don't differentiate people like that in this way it's it's for them it doesn't even exist it's just as long as you're in the struggle you know you're my you're my good friend so um yes so it was these topics transfeminism um environmental anti-racism uh, anti-capitalist groups uh, here in portugal would you like to share your experiences nikos and patricia Uh, you mean the same question with uh, which kind of groups participated? Uh, yeah, exactly. Where, how, how did the Zapatistas relate to to groups in uh, in Sweden? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's quite the same. Uh, also, what have, what Anna just said, the same groups. Uh, plus, I think the like uh, they met also people who represent uh, like. Um, People from a union, the Hargo Syndicalistic Union, and uh, the people from the labor, uh, representatives from the labor uh, movement here in Sweden. Uh, and uh, yeah, and this, this is the thing that what Anna said, that they, they made it super clear from the beginning and also in one of their communiques, I think, that they will just meet whoever invited them. Uh, and if anyone has a problem with that, they shouldn't meet the Zapatistas. So they were this super inclusive thing, which was really amazing, of course, with some small uh, like uh, limits. So if there was, for example, someone that was representing the, the state or had something like this to do, then they wouldn't uh, talk with uh, such, a, such a group. But yeah, in general, yeah, very inclusive and whoever invited them, they wanted to meet. You want to share your own experience, Patricia? Uh, yeah, um, on top of the groups that met um, that met with the Zapatistas in Portugal and Sweden, um, in the Netherlands specifically, we had a lot of artists. That was really nice. And um, it's uh, something very close to the Zapatistas because so often when we talk about art, it's something quite separate from us as human beings. But for Zapatistas, when they were asked a question about art and struggles or resistance, um, formulating art as something separate from your being was something, an interesting um, conversation that was had. Um, they also met with a lot of housing rights activists here in the Netherlands. Um, 
as well as um, anarchists, um, climate movement, uh, migrants, really a lot of migrants, um, a lot of undocumented people, a lot of people of color coming from the global south, um, a lot of um, some refugees and so on. They also met with um, um, land and farming rights movements here in the Netherlands and even were able to see the places of resistance where people were trying to stop um, building a super highway or something like this. And it was really inspiring when they would tell all of us, uh, all of these people around the Netherlands, to continue your fight in your geography, in your time, and how it has to be done. And was reminding all of us to be in solidarity with each other. Um, and like um, Nico said, like if there were people who were representing the state, they could be there just in the background. But they were really more interested in meeting the people who were in part of the struggle, like the from the left and below here in the global north, so to, so to speak, and for them to hear um, how people are being part of the struggle in this, uh, in this geography. So it was very nice um, for different groups to meet, not just the Zapatistas, but for all of us also to come together as well and meet each other because it's not very often that there's a reason for people to come together this way, so yeah. That's great. Actually, uh, we always have this feeling that uh, activists are not communicating with each other, right? That we are all a little bit uh, apart from each other. So it's really good that somebody from the outside, it's even sometimes uh, easier <laughs> to make the, the groups come together, right? Uh, just going a little bit, a little bit back to in, our, uh, in this, um, this conversation. Uh, could you tell, uh, tell tell us a little bit about uh, how did you get involved uh, with the pan-European collectives and national collectives that were uh, supporting and organizing the trip uh, from Zapatistas to Europe? Uh, what exactly does it entail? Do you need, uh, what did you have, in, in practical terms, what did you have to do? Uh, how did you uh, find a, manage to... Uh, involved the M25 somehow in this um, in this organization. Although we know that uh, Zapatistas wanted to to be very independent from any political movements, how how was it all this experience with the uh, with the collectives? As you said, Nadir was like very challenging. The the preparations uh, were very tough and hard and complicated sometimes because of, of what you said the the fragmentation that. That we face in uh, in in Europe and in other parts of the world, of course, and uh, the difficulties that we have to communicate, um, especially if between uh, people who are uh, completely they have different backgrounds that they that they came together just for one reason, but they have different backgrounds, and also it's very hard if you don't really know the other and you don't have time to, to meet the other with a different background. Um, and also another difficulty was the, that if you want to, uh, to act in a horizontal and uh, with uh, a process of consensus in order to organize something, then you need time. And also you need uh, people to, that you know or time to get to know them in order to trust them because all these structure are based on um, trust. So it was very hard, but nevertheless, we managed to finally to overcome all these uh, uh, difficulties and all the, the issues. And uh, we found all the necessary resources, funds and whatever. And, and it was great that we, uh, we, actually there were points that I was thinking that, oh, maybe we won't make it. Yeah, at least in Sweden, but finally we made it. So the organization was in, uh, uh, there was a, an organization at European level and also in, um, uh, in Sweden had in a national level and also in a regional, uh, level. Uh, so as you can imagine, there was like the every day, like almost every day stuff to do with meetings and, uh, uh, a lot of things and nice and uh, hard and everything. Uh, and also the other thing that we started, uh, I think it was in, uh, in May, uh, we, we organized uh, with uh, the many comrades from uh, DiEM25 all uh, around Europe. 
and actually not only uh, Europe, they were also from other parts of the world, uh, because we created um, a thematic DSC just for the for this region, for the trip of the Socrates in Europe. Um, and we finally had uh, dozens of members uh, where we were sharing mostly information and uh, contacts for uh, whoever wanted to, to join uh, this initiative of, of the trip uh, in uh, their own uh, countries uh, that the Sabatistas would visit. And uh, uh, we managed also to do some other stuff. And I was very glad for this because I, I saw how DM25 also worked in, um, in this level, like having something very challenging and how we all managed in different departments of uh, DM25 to, uh, to, to, to communicate and work together, like having a, a very successful uh, fundraising campaign, which was based on the, uh, crowdfunding that, uh, that we did and also uh, we even did, um, uh, we sold merch connected to the Sabatistas uh, through our online, uh, webshop. So there were many, many different levels uh, that we organized and it was really great. All this whole thing. And again, arts played a big role on it because we knew we, we used the arts from the Zapatistas to make these beautiful bags and t-shirts. That some people had the, the chance to <laughs> to buy. Um, Anna, do you want to share your experience in this connection between uh, the Zapatistas and DM25? I know you wrote an article too, all of you, right? At the, some point. Uh, uh, Nico, Nico's wrote an article in the beginning also when the Zapatistas arrived by boat, the first, uh, the squad or two one. This was in June. Uh, it was the first seven Zapatistas who came um, in this in this trip, and then afterwards in September, um, 180 arrived by plane uh, to to Vienna. Uh, to add to Nico, what Nico said, it was it was very similar uh, experience here. This um, this getting to know each other, um, working with people you you had never met before. Uh, all of that, and it was very intense period of of um, intense period because uh, you had to fundraise, you had to organize all the logistics. So there were also different committees. Uh, also at a European level, there was a legal committee, um, and and when they were not arriving, they were trying to find out ways of getting them to Europe because there were so many issues, uh, passports, and then uh, because of COVID restrictions and all that. Um, there was a financial committee uh, and, and the regions could choose if they wanted to do a regional uh, finances or, or national finances or European finances. So all of these different levels were happening and, and communications. Uh, we, we wanted to be constantly communicating what is happening, but at the same time, uh, you were not allowed to take pictures or videos or you were not allowed to stream the events. So um, there, there were, we had three independent media outlets here in Portugal that were uh, accompanying the entire trip. One is uh, guillotine.info, um, the other is Journal Mapa, and the third is Petit uh, Revolution. So these three were always um, accompanying and, and putting out content uh, in relation to the, uh, to the tour for life uh, here, and uh, not only here, but also uh, in zone one and zone two. Um, Yes, yeah, so so it was it was challenging, like buying tickets uh, and buses and trains and arrange all the meetings and all the events, uh, and on top of that to be um, to be making sure you know that you're healthy financially <laughs> to be able to cover all this. So, yes, Patricia, do you have anything to add to this experience? Uh, yeah, um, I think it was very similar to um, Sweden and Portugal, really. Um, and I just wanted to share to add like the actual, the actual experience of organizing. I know a lot of people when they think about activism, it's what you see on the streets, it's what you see people protesting. But actually, it's really, really a lot, a lot of administrative and coordinating work and communication. 
And it's really putting in the hard work, as Nico said, that you have several meetings day in and day out. And it's national meetings, city level meetings. You're going to meet each of the committees. Like the fin- we had finance a committee, a security team. Um, there's also a health team, legal team, the care team, the social media team, the merchandise team. We also had a team for translators. So you have to really think about all of these little things. And it's not just something that just happens. People actually have to do the, the hard work. It's a lot of these organizing, collaborate, collaborative coordination and communicating. And it was an experience to be able to find a common ground with people who have different styles of working, who have different styles of collaborating in their own organizations. And I think something that helped the Netherlands was when we came together as different collectives, organizations, individuals, activists, whatever background you have, um, it helped us a lot when we kind of um, let go, so to speak, with in quotation marks of of our titles, of our of these networks and organizations we belong to, and um, from then on, for that moment, we called ourselves um, Hira Holanda to be that one united network, really putting in, sharing resources, sharing your network, sharing your time to achieve this bigger picture and bigger goal. And it's beyond just um, beyond just receiving the Zapatistas, but also the goal of the Zapatistas for us to have that solidarity here in the Netherlands, here in Europe, and so on. So I think that really helped us a lot, especially if you want to employ a very... Uh, a horizontal kind of structure it's it's difficult because um, we've been organizing all of us here in this group have been organizing for at least half a year it's it's really months i think we started like april or may and to sustain that without knowing when the zapatistas are arriving because the bad governments were making it difficult for them to get to, the, to europe to sustain that effort to sustain the momentum for people to find the funds to coordinate at the European level, at national levels, at regional or city levels. It really is a lot of day in, day out. Just doing the work, you know, writing, taking down notes, listening to people. It's really a lot of that. And I think it's one, as one of our compas said, it's an an experience in uh, an exercise in organizing for all of us. So that was something really, um, really good. And I think it was, I, I would believe it was similar to Enikos and Anna's experience when we would talk about what's going on in our own countries, when they would have their own meetings and they would have their own groups meeting and um, planning something. So, yeah, it was, it was really nice. And I think that's something um, we were not prepared for. Even if you have years of organizing experience, this is another level altogether of coming together from a uh, Europe wide and then a national and then yeah. So it was just a great experience of organizing for all of us. And it's actually really inspiring for any DM25 member who wants to get uh, active uh, in our movement. Uh, and unfortunately, yes, all what we want to do and all what we want to achieve will uh, demand a bit of effort, a bit of time. And, uh, but I think uh, when we uh, managed to organize a little bit like you did, uh, it's a it's a very good example that we can really achieve amazing things. And um, now I know that Anna was uh, in Madrid to say goodbye to one of the last groups that were in Europe. Can you tell us a little bit about this last experience you had uh, re- very recently? It was uh, last week, right? Uh, yes, it was very. It was the the last. Um... Yes, the, the last day, they they flew back from Madrid to Mexico on the 6th of December, on Monday. So they concentrated um, all the 180, all the 28 uh, groups of Escuchi Palabras um, were, were in Madrid for the last days. And on Saturday, there was um, a football match between Ixel Ramona and uh, Independiente de Vallecas. Um, I think, and on Sunday, it was uh, one uh, big event in an auditorium with concerts and poetry, and some of the um, some of the organizers from different countries also said some words uh, as as the as the Portuguese coordination. We went um, 
up to the stage and we sang uh, a version with with a, a new with new lyrics from the Chiquitita by Abba because <laughs> because our group was always uh, listening to this song. Uh, they put it in the mornings or they put it in the car. So we uh, there was this lyrics that was a bit like telling the anecdotes of what happened during their visit in Portugal. So it was. Do you want to uh, sing for us? Thank you. No, and <laughs> um, but it was an emotional moment. Uh, I think there were many tears by me, by like everyone. So many people there um, had really given a lot. You know, like what Patricia was saying. It's 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 every day. It's consistency. It's hard work, and and people were very tired but very happy. And it was so this this mix where you just cry. And um, and of course, seeing them leave after all that they have given us, I think that um, it it it's yes, it's an their struggle is already an inspiration. But to see them, someone who has been for three months, they were out of their homes preparing and and waiting for the time they could come, and then for another three months, they were every day having meetings or traveling for hours or not knowing where they're going to sleep, what they're going to eat just sleeping where they are told to sleep, just eating what they're told to eat. Um, and every day, every meeting, they were 100% there. They were giving all their presence. They were uh, taking notes of absolutely everything people were saying. And to, to see that, to understand that, yes, I'm tired, but what are they? They must be, <laughs> they must be so tired and still they are doing it. And they, they are not only they're not complaining and they're not, and they're very happy to be doing it. They, and if you ask them, they will say, this is, it's great to see that uh, we can find people here who are also struggling, who also understand the fight and um, with whom we can have these exchanges. Uh, and, and if you, whenever you ask them, they would be uh, very happy to be, to be here and to be able to do this work. They are delegates. So they, they are, they will always remind you that what they're saying is not their own words, but it's the words of the thousands of Zapatistas that have stayed back. Um, and they have this sense of responsibility and this sense of collectiveness that is something we can really learn from. And they are, it's, it's tireless, uh, tireless work that they do. I heard uh, the Zapatistas left some uh, really important messages for us Europeans here. Uh, Nico, Nico, do you all, would you like to recall what uh, the Zapatistas uh, wrote to the National Collective in Sweden, uh, if I'm not wrong? The main feedback that the, they gave us, uh, the, the delegation that visited uh, Sweden, was that they were very, very happy uh, that they finally met so many people in this part of the world, in the Northern Europe. In, in Sweden, that they were struggling, they're struggling and uh, uh, they, they, they participate in different types of struggles, but uh, that we are so many and in so many small groups. Uh, but since we fight, even if there's the different struggles, we fight for the same causes. And uh, their main thing that was that, that Yes, it's great that you fight and that you participate and you are active, but it would be great if you manage to focus on what really unites uh, all of you and uh, to focus on your on the common ground that you have and not on the difference that you have. Because if we really want to to, to have an impact and uh, to to fight for life, uh, we need to be. Uh, United and create a bigger coalition, uh, which of course is um, something that also Diem says and also many other uh, organizations and uh, people say. But hearing it from those who have already managed to do this thing and they have like so like so, they're so united, uh, it has a much uh, different impact. And also the way that they said it, like that that you are the, we are so grateful and we will take this back home from us, that, that you are, you, you face the same problems with us and you fight. You're not, you haven't surrendered in Europe and in Sweden, uh, but it would be great if you could create something like bigger coalition that you can manage to focus on your, 
uh, similarities in the common causes. Patricia, do you want to say something about this? I already have a question prepared, but. <laughs> no, I, I just, I second everything that, that Nika says. It's really something that they said to us in, in different occasions is to, I think that's something that we have to remember is to fight in your own time and in your own pace and in your own geographies. And to also really look around at what's happening in your, in your places, because um, a lot of the times you don't really see the other um, other struggles that are happening just beside us or just around us or just even within our own circles, within our own relationships, our own organizations and groups. So yeah, um, that's just something that they really highlighted. It's to fight in your own time and to fight in your geographies and also, as Nikos was saying, to find that solidarity and that common ground and to fight together. And uh, so my question was, uh, what do we need in DM25 to make uh, our activists feel so united and uh, with so much strength and time and uh, dedication uh, to make us fight like the Zapatistas do? What do you think we can, uh, how could we, um, what are the topics that you think that could uh, move more people right now uh, in Europe? to make us feel so united. I think Nikos wanted to add something before we move on, maybe. Yeah, I can answer also and I'm putting this question, but uh, I just want to say that another feedback that we had and I forgot to mention, and maybe this can be connected with your question now, Nadia, about what we can do in DM in order to make the activists be more active and more united, is that what the Sabatistas said and what they're doing is like to fight it's, it's good to demonstrate and have, uh, because they saw this thing that we have in Europe, that we demonstrate a lot and they were very excited also about this, but they said, it's good to fight against something uh, and demonstrate and march and do everything. Uh, but it's also better to fight for something, uh, to create something. And uh, maybe this is, for me, this was, this is very like, uh, it inspires me a lot. And I think it can inspire a lot of activists that we are always in a mood in, um, uh, uh, in Europe, I don't know, probably in, in other places as well, that, um, that we need to fight against capitalism, against this, against that, but we forget to create space for something that can work in parallel with this, uh, problematic system that we need to abolish. But before abolishing it, we need to create something and to create something, we need to be united. We need to be all together and this. This, this can create also the basis for what will come next, because we, of course, this system is collapsing by itself, by us, it will collapse, but we need to have already created some. And I think this is something that can be done and can inspire the activists also in, uh, in DiEM25. Yes, maybe adding to that, I think uh, this difference between revolution or constant uh, rebellion, joyful rebellion, is that one is just seizing power, but then you are inside the same house or the other is building a house that is actually outside of it already. So when this one big house collapses, you already have your own. So building this, it takes a lot of creativity, imagination, uh, work, of course, and consistency. And, and maybe that is something that can motivate people is you can choose what is it that is important for you? What is it that isn't, do you think should, uh, should we take into our futures? So, so th maybe this motivation to, uh, to contribute that you can contribute your own, um, thoughts and values, maybe that's something that can motivate, um, activists. Um, and to add to that, um, like what Anna was saying a while ago about the Zapatistas constantly taking notes, constantly listening and everything. I think that's something that. Um, for the first time, I really see in practice where people take the time to really listen to each other and they really practice their their seven um, principles, which is um, when you read it, it's not, it seems very difficult or very detached. But to see an actual group practice it every day because they would meet all the time at the end of the day or in the beginning, talk about what they did, what they're about to do. And you would hear them self-reflect, give self-criticism, and really listen to each other and build that community. 
And I think that's something we should be able to practice, given that I think at least maybe in the global north here in Europe, we have some more privileges. We're not really as persecuted as or disenfranchised as the Zapatistas or other indigenous communities. But um, to really practice the things that we are fighting for and fighting against, like Nikos was saying, creating what we want, but also understand what it is we are fighting against and for. Because we, I, I see with the Zapatistas that they, they know and they truly understand what they are fighting against and what they are fighting for, what they want to build. They understand how deeply rooted um, the racialized struggle is, the struggle against capitalism, the struggle against patriarchy. They really, truly understand it and they see it in what they're fighting for. But then at the same time, they have also created structures within their community, such as, for example, the revolutionary laws for women in the Zapatista community. We know that there are many feminist um, groups all over the world, but um, have we as a society created what Nikos was saying, that space and what Anna was saying, that house outside that we want to, to achieve once we have burnt down capitalism <laughs> and fought everything. So, And also that whole thing where a world where many worlds fit is something that I truly saw in them in practice and something that they were able to create in such a space when they arrived in, in Europe. It's really, really, truly inspiring. And I hope um, all of us here, um, Anna and Nikos and I were saying that we hope that more of the DMers around Europe were able to attend or participate in some way or meet the Zapatistas because being in that space with them and being really inspired with is something is that kind of hope that we're kind of looking for now with, with all of these things happening around us with the climate and bad governments all over. So I think it's something that as DMers, we just have to really remember to put in the work, but also at the same time, um, listen to everyone, you know, the whole, the, the structures and everything. We have to just really take the time to listen, to check in on everyone, to really learn how to listen and to understand each and everyone's um, um, fights, their own struggles, their own needs, and see that there really is a common, a common struggle there and that we should put that in our plate as DM, not, not just in the Netherlands, but DM as that movement and to really represent all of that. Otherwise, we might fail to achieve what we want to achieve. So it's really something we just need to do. It's really just day in, day out of work, of listening, of taking time. And like the snail, you know, it's big and slow in the beginning and then it goes faster and faster and then we're going to get there. But we just really have to go through all these difficult things first. So, yes. Um, I think we're almost uh, finishing our conversation, but now I would like just to, to ask you, uh, if you're, wh what's your future plans in terms of uh, fights, struggles, uh, activism? Do you have any ideas for 2022? Where do you want to get active? Uh, what will you do at DM25 level or in any other uh, areas of your lives? So for me, this is something that we said before that uh, I think uh, Patricia mentioned it uh, mostly that People don't really understand what, how difficult this thing was in order to organize this whole thing. And they see some stuff happening and they're like, oh, okay, but it was very hard. But on the other hand, they can also, they don't really realize uh, all the benefits that we have from all this hard work and stuff that, so uh, this is also something like for direct action for the activists that of course you need time and you, you have to be a bit privileged in order to have all this time to work. Uh, for stuff like that, it's hard work, but the benefits are great. And for me, for example, and I think it's also for Anna, uh, Patricia, that, um, I, w I met so many people for that. They were living in a small city in Stockholm. It's not a big city. And I didn't know that they exist and also places that I met and, and, uh, organizations and movements and, uh, all of this, uh, now has concluded inside me and I have met. Uh, I have become part of uh, some uh, movements, as I told you before. Uh, for example, I'm in a group with uh, uh, that is uh, helping and uh, 
uh, undocumented people, uh, like legal stuff and uh, financial and many different things. Uh, also environmental. I mean, this is uh, it. I, I think I am around in seven, eight different groups right now, and this happened, of course, before the Sabatistas, but from the Sabatistas experience that we came so close with all these people, it really boomed. And, and I think that this is what we're trying to do now, to focus on how to create new spaces uh, that we can have, like liberated spaces, that we can all have a network that we have already built to sustain it and, and not be fragmented. And this is my goal now for the next year, to manage to to create this network with the different groups that I have met and I, I also uh, am a member of, uh, to make it a, a solid kind of network, not like just being part of this group and that group and the other group and finally fighting for the same cause, needing the same resources, in reinventing the wheel every time. No, we need to make it like a network that can have, can start from a point and to reallocate everything, all the resources that we need. I wanted to say that also from the Zapatistas, we received a request to uh, evaluate um, what everything that happened, all the events, uh, the encounters, uh, what went uh, well in the organization, what went, what went wrong. Uh, and this evaluation we need to send in until January, or fe January or February, I think. Um, so this is also another example of this of this work. You know, it's it's. Um, I think we are not used to this consistency. You know, it's like, oh, okay, now they're gone. Okay, we can breathe. But no, you know, you have to continue the work. You have to continue these networks that we created. We have to sustain them. And this is something I, I towards the end of the trip, I asked. Um, I asked them, so what was the highlight, you know, what <laughs> in these three months of touring Europe? But they, they don't fall into these kinds of traps. Uh, they will have um, more more conscious answers. Uh, and uh, they told me that, you know, we, we are so happy because we came here with our hands full of seeds to spread around Europe. And we had no idea what if we would find fertile ground, but we we came anyways, and we actually did find it, and we we're so happy. And now uh, we go back, not with empty hands, but with full hands again, because of uh, all of your seeds that we bring back. So it's this exchange and this inspiration. So we take this inspiration from them, and they can take the inspiration from finding us here. And hopefully, we are fertile ground. So hopefully we we can water the seeds, we can uh, nurture them and and make them grow. Beautiful image to finish off our episodes. Anna, Nikos, Patricia, thank you so much. We'll be back soon to, with uh, other examples of activists from DM25, and uh, I hope you will be one of them next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.